moving forward. It's a kind of like a moving target. And so we're recording the session today for those people who have already emailed me and asked, but it's probably going to be slightly outdated even, you know, within a year from now, we're going to have to update what it is we know and what we think. So thank you for being here and we look forward to your expertise as well. So my name is Janet Mitchell Lambert. I am the lead distance education coordinator at Cerritos and I also teach English and I'm here with Lynn Serwin who is a DE coordinator of student engagement and support and English as well. And then I'm here with Nikki Lovejoy Robold, who is an English faculty member and um, a pedagogy export extraordinaire. And so as we get started, um, I just wanna share with you that we look forward to knowing what you know as well. So we're gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen. Just one second. All right, so today we're going to be talking about workshopping best practices for AI in terms of assignment and policies. I wanted to start out though with a questionnaire, just seeing really quickly how we all sort of feel about this. And um, I'm gonna share this with you. It's in the slideshow, but I'm gonna copy it and put it in the chat as well. Just take a moment to think about how you all feel about what's going on with AI. It should take you a minute about how you feel where do you, where are you in the spectrum? How do you feel like you don't even know what AI is? You don't want students to use it all the way down to, I'm excited to see the possibilities and I'm all in. And then here's a spot for questions. And even if we're not able to get to your questions now, they're gonna be helpful for us as we move to the future. Can we have more than one answer? You can right here, yes, yes. That's what Nikki asked. <laughs> she goes, is there more than one? <laughs> and that's a good question. Uh, not completely, Kevin, but maybe down the line. I would ask that question in the document so we have it for later. I'm going to give you maybe another minute or so. I can't seem to select the answer that I want. <laughs> it just won't do the checkbox for the one like I'm excited or like I'm interested in using the possibilities or whatever. I can't look at that in Google. <laughs> like I can't, hold on. I just can't select the ones that I want. Do, do your best, do your best. And maybe Lynn can fill that one and maybe she can, Lynn will do a second one and she'll I'll double check the document and make sure it's okay. okay. I actually could do it the second time I tried. Okay. I don't know what it was, okay. Excellent. Everybody who has a question about uh, Turnitin, go ahead and put it in there so that we can respond to it at another time, even if it's not today. I'll give you about 20 more seconds or so.
Janet, while we're waiting, I'm just going to offer a public service announcement that the Dodgers are winning, beating the Padres eight to five. <laughs> just because I know some of you want to know that. Yeah, I really don't, Steve, but thank you. We're going to go. Giants see. fan. <laughs> Janet's a Giants fan. I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. I'm going. We're going to go to a game, though, against the Padres uh, Labor Day weekend. I'm excited. So, Giants, Padres. But thank you for that public service announcement. Okay, let's. All right, we have 26. You can keep, please keep, if you have questions, that may be why that you have questions, but let's um, take a look. All right. Okay, so a lot of us are, I don't want, you know, we have a good 38%. I don't want students to use it at all. Um, we have some people who are super excited about it. They're a little worried about it. Um, and I think these are people that did their little write-in responses. I'm resigned, but not excited. It's evolving, it's moving. Um, everybody seems to know what AI is, so that's good to know. Um, and then we have some questions that we'll take out, take a look at. Please continue to fill this out because again, those questions are gonna be valuable. All right, so we all have feelings. And if you're like Christine who said, can I choose more than one? You could ask me on any given day and any given time, I might have a different feeling. There are days where I'm like, this is ruining writing. I'm very upset about it. And then other days where I'm like, this is really cool. I'm super excited about it. So I am actually uh, going to let us let you know what we're gonna talk about. And then I'm gonna pass the baton over to Nikki. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what uh, AI is and isn't, give you some suggestions about poly syllabus policies, and then give you some examples of assignments and assessments. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand over the baton to Nikki. Thanks, Nikki. Hey everyone. Um, so you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Yes. We, okay. Oh, you know what we did, and then now we can't. We are seeing okay. your text messages. Oh, that's weird. Okay, let me stop that. Um, can you just put the screen back up? Your presentation back up. I please, can. Janet, and I can do it. I that can. And All right, there, that, that that works. Okay. I figured so, by twenty twenty three we would have like Zoom figured out, but you know. All right. All right so I'll, um, we're starting on slide four. So. Anyone who knows me knows that I love memes and I use them all the time. Um, so as Janet said, uh, I went to the online teaching conference in June and was really interested in AI just because I'd been following academic Twitter throughout the spring semester while I was on sabbatical and like there were just like a lot of really big feelings and I was starting to look into it. Um, but a lot of the links and resources and stuff like that that um, we're sharing with you today and then on various Google Docs um, are mostly from the conference and then as well as like my own and Janet's and Lynn's and like everybody else who's like been having conversations with me about this. So I know that like AI develops quickly and it changes quickly and it's and it's hard to feel as if you have a good sense of what it is and where it's going and how to respond to it, um, but it's all going to be okay, right? Like the whole goal of today's session is like it's all going to be okay. All right, so um, next slide, please. So on, I just kind of wanted to start with like ways in which we're already using AI in our daily lives that we might not really recognize or like keep constantly remembering. Um, so we um, are using AI in texting and emails, especially with like predictive text or autocorrect, use it in Google searches, like for example, when Google fills in the rest of our query, we use it in map in apps, like if you use Todoist or social media or plugins or things like that. So with, since I teach English writing support, like we use it with Grammarly, citation generators, like EasyBib, for example, um, spelling and grammar checks and, and things like that. So if you want to participate in the chat or if you just want to share something, is there any place else that we use AI already? Hmm. 
in Photoshop. Yep, about, totally. Uh, the GPS yeah. uh, can give us different routes when there's a traffic. Yep. So anything related to the machines making decisions, uh, we can call it by AI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even playing games. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're predicting, they're not making decisions. <laughs> yeah. Alexa, yeah. yeah. Any of those smart speakers. All right. Don't we use it? <laughs> I am loving all of the um mm -hmm. all of the responses that are coming in. Yep, all true. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's start with a little bit of background, and I'm going to hand this back over to Janet. All right, so a brief definition just and this is actually I copied this right off of my policy sheet AI tools and I had not thought about this before that we probably should have a definition for our students, so they know what it is, they may know sort of how to use it, but they may not be able to describe what it is so. It's a large language model or an LM, LLM that relies on input and they are both adaptive and formulaic <laughs> so that they do both, which sounds odd, but they're both adaptive and formulated, formulaic. And really the goal is to create this human-like conversation and writing. This is quickly changing and developing um, and it's gonna continue to improve in quality, which is Again, both good and bad, depending on how you look at it. And AI tools uh, scrape the internet for information and put it together in one place. For example, generating ideas, instruction steps for a process, general information on a topic, and surface level applications. And this is this was Nikki rewording this in student-friendly language. So thank you for that, Nikki. So I just want to share with you, we attended a workshop where there were two people um, who I know fairly well, who have been doing uh, DE for a very long time, and they actually researched and checked on the best tools to use. And what they found were good ones were perplexity, chat GPT, and Google Bard, but they loved perplexity. They thought that one was a good one to use. So as a result of that, not because I did all my research with 20 different, 20 different AI LLMs, uh, I am taking their word for it. And I will be asking them if anything has changed probably in about six months. But this is the one that I instruct my students to use. Um, so it's important to understand what AI can and can't do. And again, this comes from my policy list. And this is a collection of ideas that we learned from the OTC. So what it's really good at, and these are things that we can think about in supporting students and using it. Uh, grammar and correctness, uh, some organization and structure. It can help you with generating ideas and lists and outlines. It can help to elaborate your ideas. A lot of times students have a hard time with that. And then it also helps you to consider counter argument. So you have an idea. So what's the opposite of that idea you really believe in? What it doesn't- and these, I'm sorry, can I just add that these are primarily for text generation, AI text generation, correct? Now we know AI can do code, AI can do images. It can do a lot That's of right. things. So we're right. talking specifically here about text generation, right? Right, right. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. What it doesn't do well is it doesn't necessarily give you accurate information. It doesn't use super current knowledge. At this point in time, uh, it doesn't use information that's uh, older than that or that's newer than a year old. So if you're wanting to look up some current events, it doesn't do the current events. It's not very good at being equitable. It tends to um, focus in on white males um, because that's the information that is in all of our collective browsers. It makes up sources. So it can cite sources that are unreal. Um, it often does not write with an authentic voice. In fact, as Nikki and I were talking about, and I've run into this myself with my students, some of their writing is beyond what I would do. <laughs> you know, it's like professional. 
and it, but it, there's not that real sound to it. And so it doesn't uh, write with that authentic voice and it doesn't write at the depth required at our collegiate level. It's more surfacey. So it's important to, for you to all know that MLA in joint task with the four C's, they actually have uh, come up with this uh, discussion about critical AI literacy and the importance. So this was just last month about how important it is. And I'm just gonna focus in on the fact that uh, students and teachers should be made aware of bias and inaccuracy and students and teachers should be aware of AI. So even if we want to put our heads in the sand and kind of ignore AI, it's not a good idea because students know it's there, we know it's there and just to proceed like normal is not gonna work so well in any of our classes. Um, Nikki, I am going to pass it back to you. Awesome, okay. So uh, next slide, please. So um, when we're talking about AI policies um, and the creation of AI policies, there are some things to keep in mind um, and we have created hyperlinks to our own policies um, that we've used like, um, over the summer. Um, so one thing that we should keep in mind is that AI detectors are not very reliable. Um, there are a lot of studies that are coming out about um, how it's just like, it's really hard for like turnitin.com, for example, to identify AI detection. Like turnitin.com says that they are able to identify, you know, like within a 1% margin error. And that like third party studies don't support that evidence. Um, but it's, it's hard for AI detectors to actually work. Um, and so like we should not, like as faculty and individuals who are encouraging students to ethically write summative assignments or assessments, um, we cannot rely on AI detectors to, to like identify when AI is being used. I mean, like it's really obvious when students are using AI just because it's very surface level. It doesn't sound like them. It's it's very different, um, but you know, it's, it's just important to keep those in mind. I mean, like even turnitin.com for citations would flag students for having like too many sources, even if they're properly cited or would flag students if they are paraphrasing or things like that. So there are all of these like um, instances in which like we might rely on technology to, to help support us or to help provide proof or things like that for us that like we can't do with AI. Um, so, in this link right here, there are um, suggestions from other campuses and other disciplines. It's a really incredibly thoughtful, well-prepared, like great collaborative effort on behalf of academics across the country who are um, identifying what their own AI policies are. So I highly encourage you all to, to check that out. Including in SEM. So yeah. I, I don't want to keep scrolling down, but there's, it's not just English, it's other classes as well. So it's a good idea to take a look and see what others are doing. Nikki, do you want to share your policy or do you want? Yeah, you can share it. Okay. And maybe point out a couple of key yeah. things that you made sure to keep into yours. Yeah, if you want to scroll down. So this was uh, created for my middle summer session. So this is like before I went to the conference um, and where I was still a little squiffy on like, you know, AI and how it could be used in the classroom and stuff like that. So I just, I put, I was like very honest and transparent in here where I was like, look, this is like really new. People have a lot of strong opinions about it. Let's talk about this some more. So like, you know, you can use it to provide content for assignments that you are, I'm sorry, you can't use it when you are providing content for assignments that you're submitting as your own, right? That's inappropriate. You can use it to help like model assignments when you're not sure of how to get started or like where you need some ideas. Um, you can, you know, like I just wanted to focus on like, I want to see your writing with all of the mistakes, right? And like this classroom environment is all about learning and it's okay to make mistakes. Like we are going to make mistakes I don't want perfect or correct writing. I want your thoughts. We'll be giving feedback. And then I wanted to have like class discussion for that. So that was just my, my rationale for that. 
Lynn, do you want to take a moment to point out a couple of things about yours? Uh, mine has been largely borrowed from Janet, so we probably should have looked at Janet's first. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to make very clear in my policy is what the LLM is, which ha uh, how it scrapes the internet and how it provides predictive, predictive text. Um, I think there's a misperception that uh, AI is doing the work for you, is creating this for you, and it is not doing that. I want it to be uh, not so anthropomorphized in the minds of my students, that they recognize that it is a tool that is doing something it's not thinking. It's doing something very predictive, and it's not going to give them what they want. Um, so those were the main things that where I added on uh, top of what Janet had. But for the most part, I um, I went with what what Janet had, and I love perplexity. It's a it's a really good um, AI tool. All right, go ahead, Janet. Let's go dig into <laughs> yours. Yours has it, it, the most. Well, I oh, Steve, go ahead. Quick, oh, there we go. Just a quick question, and this may seem um, silly, but I'm wondering where you where and how you let students know of these AI policies, particularly in the online class, because I know my liquid syllabus is getting overloaded and overwhelming. So I'm just curious to know how the three of you share these in a meaningful way with students. Okay, Thanks. so I okay, so I do want to share that uh, just to give an overview because that is a fantastic question. I have this linked into my academic integrity. I am going to be creating a video on it. I have not created a video. And when I introduce it to my students, I'm going to share it with them again. So it's important to have it in a variety of locations, but then also to re-show it to them. One of the things that worked out really well for me this summer, and I want I want to point out here what AI, I, I think I told you what AI is ineffective at, but right here is really important. And this is really what helped me a lot. So every single writing prompt, I noted how AI may or may not be used. And later on in this presentation, you'll see an example of what I did. It's just, it's short. You may use AI. This, I want you to use perplexity. This is how you may use it. And if you use it, you need to cite it. And so you're welcome to copy and use whatever you want here. So this is, you know, how to, how you can cite AI using MLA. And if you want to look up online, they now have how to cite AI, um, AI using APA. So to me, the best way to make sure that students understand how you are expecting them to use the AI is to be clear in the assignment that you're giving them. This is the summative assignment here. I have them practicing it in various places in formative assessments, but every single summative assessment has how they can use it. And I will tell you, Steve, my very first one, which is my shortest writing assignment, and I don't bring up AI, I say you may not use AI in this in this writing assignment at all. So there, there is a time they can't use it. And then when they can, there's different ways that they can go ahead and use it. Nikki, did you wanna add something? Or Lynn? I do no, a video. I did a video like right away. It went in the announcement and it went as uh, it's, um, uh, in the unit and in the assignment. What's great about Lynn's video, because like I said, I'm going to do one just about my policy, not about the summative assessment. I did too, yeah. Yeah, well, the video I'm thinking of is the one that you modeled. Like oh, Lynn yeah, yeah. Really model did a wonderful job modeling how to use the AI tool. I remember it because it was so thoughtful. It was football. <laughs> it was football. So she showed them how to actually use it and how to re to to uh, to make it better. Uh, Nikki, did you um, is there anything else you wanted to mention on this particular slide? Yeah, I just wanted to um, really emphasize that having discussions with your students about how 
you and your students for that class want to incorporate AI policies or come up with AI policies is really critical. Like having the student voice is, is really important in this discussion. Um, also, because AI generator tools change so frequently and so quickly, um, your policies that might start in August might not be as helpful and as supportive or as relevant by December. Um, so maybe coming back once a year, every semester, as frequently as you feel comfortable with to update and or make changes to your policies, that should also be like just built into, into your prep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, Nikki, this, this is you. Yeah. Um, so when you were thinking about creating your AI policy, like there's just some like guidelines um, that I think are important. So again, asking your students for input about that, but then also asking yourself about what you are hoping to accomplish with the policy. Like, you know, is it a combination of guidance, education, policing, punishment? Is it focused like on one area? over another, um, how does it align with campus policies? Um, this link here is to the Cerritos College um, policy for academic honesty. Um, and then like also just asking yourself, like where are places in your class where you're comfortable having students use AI? Like for example, are you comfortable having them use AI for generating ideas and essays, for example? Um, are you uncomfortable having students use AI for any other places in your um, in your classes. So like these could be like, you can use AI for generating ideas or maybe drafting an outline, but like as far as drafting, maybe a first draft or final products of a project or an assignment, like, you know, you're uncomfortable with that and then make that very clear. And again, there's currently no way for professors to prove that students are using AI. I mean, like sometimes it's like really, really obvious. Like I have started a Google Doc where I can just like copy and paste really bad examples of AI that students are using like inappropriately. <laughs> um, and that like, it's just like, okay, that's, that's too much of AI usage. Um, but then there are also times in which like students use Grammarly, for example, to help them with their editing and their proofreading that is inappropriate ethical use of AI in developing their um, writing skills. Um, and so like, just to also keep in mind that students want to do well, right? Like they want to do well in their classes, they are going to make mistakes. And as an education institution, this is a safe space for mistakes to be made, right? So like, if you suspect your students are using AI inappropriately, like you can have a discussion with them and lead with questions about their process for, you know, how they arrive to this final product, right? Like not just starting off with like, you used AI and, you know, things like that, but just like, okay, tell me about your process. How did you come here to like this final product? Like, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, and then like- Oh, Nikki, can I yeah. interrupt this? Well, I wanted sure. to add to that because, you know, you were talking about updating your policy. Like I updated it recently, just, you know, I'm finishing up the summer, but probably what I'm going to do, just based on what you said, I'm probably going to add something to my policy about I will be expecting to see your writing drafts. So do not erase your drafts. And there's going to, there may be times that I ask you to please share various drafts for me. So make sure I'm expecting you to, you to have at least three or at least four or at least two or whatever it is. So because I want to be able to see the drafting and sometimes students opt out of doing that first draft and decide that they're going to lose the points on that and just submit the final draft. And so I think I'm going to add something to my policy specifically about the expectation of seeing the pre-writing and a draft, you know, when, when you've gotten to two pages or three, I'm going to be very specific. So I'm going to come up in my head, like, once you get to four pages, I want to see the draft. I want to see how it changes over time um, that I may be asking for. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. And then the final two points are just like, you know, we as faculty members are not responsible for the decisions our students make, right? If our students have decided that they are going to use AI for their final summative product or assignment or assessment, like that is something that they have decided to do. We are not responsible for that, right? Um, and then, you know, if they decide to do that, again, it's not about us, right? Like, I know 
I used to feel very offended if my students plagiarized something or like, you know, like, do they not know I have access to Google as well? Um, But like, again, it's not about me. It's about the students and the choices that the student made. Um, So I just want to like keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to, if it's okay with like Janet and Lynn, like just take a brief minute or two to ask if there are any questions about AI policies um, or if there is um, anything that they have questions about for the first um, part of, of our presentation. There are questions in the chat, Nick. Yeah, I'm scrolling through them now. So, um, Christine, if you wanted to bring up your point, I think that's a good point. And then also, Barbara, if you could ask your question. Hi, everyone. Um, this is something that I have in conversation with my students um, every semester since this has started. And it's gone from like silence, yeah, we don't know about it, to oh, maybe I know a little, to like, oh, yeah, I know it. So I, I agree we need to have the conversations on, on how we can apply it. But I was a little concerned with that change in value of what is okay and what isn't okay, um, that it might deter a student who, you know, I'm not the best with technology. I am really don't wanna take on technology that I don't have to. So I would be like, as a student, oh, I'm not even gonna look at it because I'm just gonna do my assignment because that's what I'm here for. But if I started hearing that, oh, and here's what you should be using and here's how it, what this is and here's the value, it's like, oh my God, do I have to do this to get a good grade? And I, like, is this now something that I have to be doing to be competitive as a good student? You know, so so I'd be concerned about how we set that up. Um, an additional comment is I do a lot of drafting in class. And again, one doesn't help the online, but a lot of that in class drafting for best practices. So I know who is doing what, where in the process. Um, and I also reserve the right to do that oral defense that you were talking about. Tell me about how you got here. Well, this is what I saw in class. Here's your finished project fill in those blanks for me. And if they can't, it becomes really obvious. I think that your comments are really good, Christine. Thank you for bringing that up. I want to share that that I want to be able to showcase to students how to use the tools well. So, and you'll see in my example, I give a couple of examples of assignments that I use where I'm asking them to practice using it because I want them to know that it's available. So for me, I see it as like, you know, when people, when Nikki, Nikki uh, had the idea about we're already using it. And I remember when I first learned about ways, I was super excited about ways because I drive so far to get to work. And so ways has been fantastic, but it took a little bit and there is that sort of nervousness and that that's why that conversation is important. So students, there, there are times where it says, you, in my, my policy may say, you may choose to use AI if you want to, here's how you use it. But I do want them in practice assessments, practice assignments to learn how to use the tool in my class if it's appropriate. So like an English 100 class, because I want to introduce them to those tools and then they can make a more educated decision about it. Nikki or Lynn, did you want to add anything or anybody else? Uh, my response is in the chat, which is basically that. I do believe that we have a responsibility as educators to at least introduce them to it and to show them how it is that it can be used appropriately and inappropriately in an educational setting. I think that's that's one of the things that we have to just wrap our heads around as instructors, that this is part of our job now, in the same way that teaching them how to effectively use the internet was part of our job. We don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> I certainly don't know how to do that yet. So I want to do it with them in combination with them. And we'll get there. And then Webster had a comment about he discussed it and then students decided to use it less, right? So like if Nikki showcased her examples of what she found and then showed that to students, 
they may use it less. So I think having the conversation is important and then being clear about what your policy is, is really important. Important. Uh, Janet, can I just, I'm all in thought process right now. Um, and I think for me, it's very much been leading to this point even through plagiarism and everything, prioritizing student voice, prioritizing student mistakes. So very much in line with what Nikki's discussing that I feel like just having that conversation. And I've noticed that that trust seems to be a lot stronger with my in-person students that they, I have seen like almost no cases of AI use or blatant AI use, misuse in my in-person classes where I've seen it crop up is in my online classes. And I think it's, because they're less certain about themselves, they haven't built up that trust. There's maybe, you know, less uh, availability or confidence to reach out. So I think really finding those spaces, and I, that's a larger, I think, um, distance learning discussion in terms of building trust with students um, that I know it is um, ongoing. But really, I think also when we think of policies, supporting students in success. So thinking here's an option that this can be, because I see where students, I give a lot of choice and then students sometimes freak out and I can see where AI would be really good for that because it can just help them get their mind going, processing, specifying, um, but as an option and then moving forward. And I think as um, someone was talking earlier and I put this in the chat, I think of those examples of people following directions and then they've ended up in these like bays of water in lakes. And it's because <laughs> they're not like actively critically participating in even something like a map, right? We just get in the car and we're like, it's gonna take me where I'm supposed to go. But we do have to be conscious and critical about how we're following that map. Um, and so I like the idea of sharing that with students as an analogy, that's really kind of a clear picture of this can only take you so far. Like, right. Critically right. engaged. Right. But in a more positive sense of like success, this is a tool for success and this is how it can lead you to success right. um, and where that line might be. Well, it's interesting because, you know, Lynn has been arguing for, and maybe arguing is not the right word, encouraging faculty to make sure that they are onboarding and engaging students in their online courses. So I want to share, I don't know if I shared this with Lynn or not, but this summer, I ended up, you know, I talk about regular and substantive contact and I've always talked about, you need to have at least one opportunity for students each week in a regular class. 80% of my class includes students sharing their work in some way, shape or form. And I think that that's kind of the way where you start to build that trust, that and the Pronto tool. The Pronto tool and, and, you know, using it as a community builder and then having it available and letting students talk with one another. I just even right before this, I, I had a student say, good luck, everybody. It's the last week, you know, in my summer class. Good luck. I'm, I'm thinking positive thoughts for everybody, right? So I think having opportunities for students to showcase their work in most of what they're doing it is going to be a big deal. So for example, I will do a, a lecture. So I'll have a video lecture. I have them take notes that they're going to submit, but it's what I call it is, it, call it as an interactive mini lecture. And they have to respond in a discussion forum. Now I don't, that's not the discussion forum where they're back and forth, which I have those two. It's where, okay, you've taken notes on a lecture on this topic. Now I'm gonna have you practice using it. And not only am I gonna have you practice learning, using it, you're gonna be practicing it with everybody seeing your example if they want to, right? So they're gonna share that. So I think having that where students are sharing more as opposed to having it be mostly, uh, they're just, it's between you and them, and it, but it's mostly between them is gonna make that better. Um, but I want to make sure we get into this next part. Nikki, I'm going to hand yeah, it over. Yeah, and I just yeah. wanted to address um, Barbara's question in the chat, which is okay. about, um, oh, that went away, um, which is about, sorry, having 
um, I can, AI I policies can. for everyone's um, syllabus. And so, yes, um, I would definitely suggest that every faculty member have a policy for AI use in their in their classes. And the college does not have a policy for AI use. Um, but I think having the discussion with your students, um, not only about digital literacy, but AI literacy and creating a policy in conjunction with your students on the use of AI in the classroom is, I would definitely encourage that. And, and I just I just wanted to mm -hmm. um, add to that in that then is the college taking a position that someone I could say in my class, there will be no AI tolerated in this class. I'm not going to do that. I'm just asking is, are we now? I am highly suggesting I'm having that conversation with academic affairs. I actually sent something to the president of the school saying that we need to be thinking about this and we should have something in our policy so that we can support faculty and we can support students who might need an appeals process. So I am highly suggesting it. I don't know what they've decided to do sure, okay. or what they're going to do, but I am like trying to hit that point home because it is super important. So regardless of how you feel, Barbara, like let's say you don't want students to use AI. However, Lynn and Nikki and I have certain feelings about what we think about it, but we don't expect everybody to share our feelings. We just want to encourage everybody, regardless of how you feel, Make sure you have a policy so that students yeah, are clear. Yeah. Um, and just a real quick add to that is that I had students this summer um, related to the bot problem who used AI as their self-introduction during check-in. Yes, they do that. Yes, they can. In fact, it sounds wonky. Like they'll put in, yes. Yeah. All right. So I want to get to the assessments and everything because these are really cool. So we're going to. Yeah. Move forward. Go ahead, Nikki. You're on. Okay, I can share. My, okay, never mind. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, no. You're good. Keep it. Keep it. So, um, when you are, so can you skip to the next yep. slide, please? Thank you. Um, so Janet posted this um, part of an article from the Chronicle of Higher Ed, just about like how to think about your assignments as you're creating them, um, and so thinking about like the specific learning objectives for that assignment how students could use AI tools and working on it, um, ways in which AI might undercut the goals, mitigating that, all of those things. So it's a really great article, but those are really good questions and focus points to, um, to think about. Um, next slide, please. Um, at the online teaching conference, um, as I was like wrapping my head around all of the presentations on AI and like starting to have a little bit of a panic about what this means for my classes and my students. Um, one presentation was all about um, using Bloom's taxonomy as a framework for understanding how to create um, AI or assignments that would like help sort of push AI off to the side, right? And so in it, like having Bloom's as a framework, like really made understanding where AI works and where AI doesn't work, like super clear for me. So AI does a really good job with like the knowledge and comprehension parts of Bloom's, right? Those lower order thinking skills. And it does a somewhat okay job with like the application part. But again, that, that application sounds robotic. It's surface level. It's not really the student's voice. Since we as uh, faculty members, like we're constantly pushing our students to this higher order thinking skills of blooms, right? Like this is where AI does not work well. And this is where we should be focusing our assignments, right? Like we want students to be able to analyze and synthesize and evaluate information and they can use AI maybe depending on your classroom policies, right? But they might be able to use AI at the beginning parts, right? Where they're like developing knowledge or trying to understand how things work and then focusing on like maybe what that means, how we can, how they can evaluate those things in those assignments, right? So having Bloom's as, as a framework for how I'm creating assignments, like really makes it clear of like, okay, if I'm asking them to like translate something, okay, that's like the lower order of thinking. But if I'm asking them to like question this, that's in the higher order of thinking. And that's where I want my students to go. Does that make sense? I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, so I'm gonna, and there, there's that. 
Awesome. Okay. Um, and then uh, Janet has a suggestion from Pearson. So I'm going to let her explain that one. All right. So um, they, they had a suggestion about how to create good assignments. So this is for you to actually use AI. I don't know if you've ever used AI in the creation of your own assignments. I started to, and then, you know, so they have this, this little um, suggestion where they're asking you to think about the prompt to give it a role to be explicit and then set the parameters of your answer. So th this prep will help you to create a good assignment. And then afterwards, your editing part includes evaluating and determining, identifying and transforming it to something that you would want your students to use. So I had, there's- That's good for students too, that same model. Yeah, that same I model, think. right. So there is a sample here. This was a, a presentation for English teachers, but here's a sample. So here's the sample, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is what uh, somebody put in to one of the LL LLMs, the prompt, the Rolex, and then this is what they came up with and after they had edited it. So this, you know, there's times when it's like, I want to come up with something creative and I'm, not, I'm feeling tired. I've got to get this thing out now. And actually AI could help us too <laughs> come up with these sort of creative and nifty assignment. So I wanted to share that. Um, uh, and then I, I'm going to skip down here, Nikki, and then I'll go back up to slide 17. So I'm going to move this slide up so we don't trying to move it up. Okay. It's not going to. Anyway, I wanted to share too that um, there's articles about AI that are fairly recent from the, most of them are from the Chronicle of Higher Ed where you have, there's a paywall. So I pay that wall. So I copied and pasted, you know, if you have the, the uh, outline on here, I uh, copied and pasted several articles here that you can take a look at, include if scared of AI, don't be, should you add an AI policy, four steps to help you plan, it just got better, you know, et cetera. So I wanted to point this out here. So please keep this this uh, resource here, because in addition to the examples, you're going to have some articles that where you can actually take your time and read them and think about them a little bit more. All right. So here are some possibilities of ways to use AI in the classroom. Uh, Lynn, would you like to share your examples first? And is it okay if I close my screen and you share your screen or do you want me to open it up? Uh, that's fine. Okay. Yes, and Nikki's right. It is free. I just pay for it. Like a smart person. Um, okay. So what I put here is a assignment that I created as part of the Hypothesis Academy. And I want to point out that Hypothesis Academy is a terrific um, I'm going to put this in the chat. It's a two week program that you can take with people from around the country who are using social annotation in their classes, both online and in person or um, uh, as part of uh, uh, hybrid classes in order for their students to engage over text. And um, the Hypothesis Academy that I did over this summer was on um, using and dealing with AI uh, in social annotation. So I created an assignment for my freshman composition class that uses chat GPT or GPT-4 is what it's now called from OpenAI um, and gave my students a little bit of background, a little setup um, for the activity. I created this plan which gave them step-by-steps steps for how to write a research paper. But I came up with this plan by putting the prompt into ChatGPT. So I asked it to create a step-by-step -step plan for developing, researching, completing, experts' opinions, personal responses, presents the readers with the author's position. And then this is the step-by-step -step that it gave me. And then after it gave me the steps, I asked it to expand on the steps, on certain steps. So one of them, it was um, come up with a good topic um, 
what was it? Uh, choose a suitable topic, uh, conduct some preliminary research. I don't know that my students are gonna know what that is. So I ask them to develop it further. It shows them how to understand the guidelines. Then I ask them to define what a research question is. So the more deeper I got into the, like at the end of every um, block of text that's returned to you, you can ask the bot to do more with that level of text. So then my students would get all of this. It gives them like, this is the, such a great definition of what a research question is. It gives them samples for a research question, how to write their own research question. It's really, really helpful. And then in addition uh, to that, I um, ask them to uh, review a reading on critical reading. They will have done this before. And then they're going to socially annotate that plan. I want to ask them um, whether or not they find value in that step, no value in that step, so that they are criti being critical of the AI uh, text that's been generated and given back to them. And then this is a, a formative practice activity. They are not using the AI themselves for this activity, but they are seeing how it works and seeing the possibility. So it's a way for them to be engaged with it without feeling like they have to go make an account, use it, come up with something, present it. That's, um, that's the assignment. Um, and it's done in a collaboration with everybody in the class, with the whole class. So it would be something that I would be doing in a face-to-face -face class. We'd be doing it uh, in real time. So that's what that is. I just put the one in there. I have the video, so I will add my videos in there after we're done today. You're muted, Janet. <laughs> thank you. I was saying thank you, Lynn. Those The videos, please do put those in. Those are super yeah. valuable. It's really cool. Okay. So my videos are actually embedded, so this doesn't look as fancy as it does in Canvas, but I have something where I'm introducing them to the topic of, a, of just a, including technology and including the AI. So I have technological breakthroughs and then I'm getting into the AI and I have some questions about it. I have an assignment where I'm asking them to uh, use AI to generate uh, and find resources. And so they have to find the resources and then they have to look at the resources and see if they're any good. Uh, one of my favorites is having to, I have a lecture on counter argument, and then I'm asking them to come up with samples of something they really believe in, that they have a hard time thinking somebody might think the other way, and coming up with a list of counter argument. So they're sharing that as they're practicing and getting ready to write their paper that has to include a counter argument and response to it. Um, and then here is a sample uh, prompt, writing prompt statement that I include about AI. They're all different. It just depends on what I'm having them write and why. So this is what I'm saying. You may use it. You do. I want you to use this. Here's how I'd like you to use it if you want to use it. And then I give them some things. And the recaps of... of um, things that we've practiced in the class. So um, they can use it in that particular way. All right, Nikki, do you wanna share your screen for this one? So just for the sake of time, I just wanna like, they could read that later, but okay. the module, it, this is like a whole unit for writing with AI for my English 100 class that happened in the summer, but like you guys can all read it later. And it's, it's cool. So she takes you through a whole, if you want to have an AI unit, Nikki has an entire unit asking unit. to look at AI. So these are all ideas. So Lynn has a research project. I have ways that I've sort of incorporated it in, but I haven't completely like have a whole unit. And then Nikki has her whole unit on it. I just want to like, before everybody gets super excited, there's a whole unit like that this was during my summer class, like I'd gone to the online teaching conference that weekend, I created that whole unit because my students were starting their very first like big um, project um, for the class. So like this was created in a weekend 
it will get rewritten for the fall semester. So like, I just wanted to manage expectations. <laughs> Yeah, and I want to say that too. It's all evolving. There's nothing in that assignment that's going to be the same the next time I do it. I mean, some of it will be, but it's always going to be evolving for sure. Okay, so I just wanted to go over like um, what comes next and like to provide some like clear next steps for, for everybody here. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I highly encourage everybody just to explore some AI tools, Perplexity AI, ChatGPT are the most popular ones. I really like Perplexity AI just because it also provides actual real citations and it shows them there. Um, and then there's a space for like um, a deeper understanding of things or, and it also provides suggestions for alternative questions or for more information. Um, Chat GPT is a very popular one that gets mentioned a lot. So um, having use of and examples and, and, and experience with that is also helpful. Google's Bard is pretty cool and user-friendly. So those are the three that I'm most comfortable with that I've used the most often with my classes and, and myself. Um, and then create AI policies for your class, right? So like think about what it is that you uh, want to accomplish with your policies, have the conversation with your students and be mindful that AI is going, like the generative tools are gonna be changing frequently um, as they get, you know, as they learn more and, and are used more. And then um, develop assignments that leverages the AI tool. So here are links to <clears throat> policies and, um, modules and assignments and stuff like that. Um, Janet, if you could click on the AI resources link, please, that would be amazing. Um, so I put together a Google Doc for you all. And so these are the resources from the online teaching conference this year. Um, and then how I grouped them in terms of like subject matter, but these are also part of like my um, uh, summer class AI module unit on writing with AI. So these would be like, this is what I gave to my students to have them like look at and read. I also included um, other materials and articles and resources. So I tried to group all the like New York Times articles together and all of the Chronicle of Higher Education articles together. Um, Lynn provided a scholarly journal article on large language models. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and then here's a space for additional resources. The um, uh, first mentioned, the AI chat pots, chat bots, chat GPT for teachers is a course that takes about 40 hours. Francie Claus Berryman in the English department found it. It's for free, um, but it goes over like what AI is, how it could be used for students, how it could be used for teachers, things like that. It's a really good resource, um, especially if we are still learning about it or still working through it. So I just wanted to, to mention that. And then um, going back to the list, there's the links to Bloom's Taxonomy, the um, Academic Honesty page, and then the MLA 4Cs Joint Task Force. And then we put in um, links for materials that, have, that are in the presentation and then Academic Honesty Policies. One final thing I want to talk about is that Santiago Canyon College in Orange, I think, um, has an AI campus, which has like a whole bunch of resources for educators at the community college level, um, including AI policy and academic honesty policies. And then um, the Google Doc that mentions all the um, policies for a variety of disciplines is also here too. And that's all I wanted to mention about that. That's a treasure trove right there. Yes. Yeah. There, there's a lot here to keep everybody busy. All right. So, Nikki, did you want to talk about this one as well, or do you want me to? Um, with you? I can do it. Um, so things, some things to keep in mind, right, as like everybody is working through this, you don't have to know everything about AI right this moment. It is okay to be at a space in which like you have a lot of questions, you have a few answers. Like I, I just want to make that clear. It's going to be okay. It's okay to have a lot of questions. We can continue to have this conversation. Um, some helpful things is that uh, to keep blooms in mind when we're creating um, assignments and assessments, um, plagiarism detection checkers can't really accurately detect AI use. Um, 
including AI use instructions for summative assessments are really helpful, including, converse, including students in the conversation about academic honesty policies, it's critical and highly encouraged. Um, providing examples for using AI is helpful and AI generators are going to continue to change. And then finally, this is, this is okay. We, this is an okay place to be. So what questions and comments and concerns do you all have? Stunned faces. <laughs> this is a question I have. So uh, 